All right, we got another GitHub Copilot cleanup video. Of course, I am a fan of Copilot, but it does yield some weird results sometimes. And this time it came up with some truly horrific code that also had a bug in it. So let's go take a look over in VS Code right now, and I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Okay, so what I asked it to do was give me a function that would merge two arrays of objects together with a given key. So let's go down here. And so the first parameter is an array, and the second parameter is also an array. And then the third parameter in this case is the key that you want to index on. So in this case, the key would be ID. And so each of these two arrays has a bunch of objects in them and they all have ID and then some extra data on it. All right, so let's put this aside for a second. And in this case, we've got an ID one that's A and then an ID two that's B. And then we got a second ID one that's C. And so the contract here is that we come out the other end where we have overwritten ID one as the name of A with ID one name of C, and then we retain ID two because there's no collisions there. All right, so let's go and grab the <laughs> implementation that it gave us and create a new Quaka sheet. So Quaka is a workbook type system. In this case, it's running TypeScript in here, and all you need to do is just code, and you dynamically see the output of that code. So I've also got some tests. Now I don't refactor without tests, so here are our tests. But before I pop those in there, we can see that in this case, we've got these white squares and that's saying that the merge arrays function is not getting called yet. So I'm going to paste this in and we can now see that those go to green, meaning that merge arrays is getting called. So we created this assert function. It just takes a value of the Boolean. And if it's not true, that returns an assertion failed. Then we call that merge arrays with exactly the same data as we had before. And then we run a bunch of assertions against it. The output is going to be two, the ID of the first one is going to be one and so on and so forth. But now let me demonstrate the bug here. So if I go and add on two more items and I say that this is C and this one is D. So what would you expect the output to be? Well, we expect that any duplicates are going to get overwritten, right? So we're only going to have one three in here. But as it turns out, and here we can see this in this pop up, we actually now have as an output two ID threes. We actually have both of those retained, which is really weird. And for me, that's a bug. So, but I'll make the assertions work in this case, and we'll just keep that buggy behavior for a little bit until we get rid of it. So the first thing that pops out to me about this code is that it is not idiomatic JavaScript. It's not written like you'd write JavaScript. In fact, nobody has written JavaScript like this since the beginning of JavaScript. And why? Well, these for loops actually kind of point that out to me. These are old style checked for loops. And even in languages like C and C++, there are now ways to do this a lot more safely. So you should never ever write code like this. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do is fix these. So how do you do this in ES6 JavaScript? Well, you're gonna use the in operator if you wanna get an index. So I'm gonna do const i in array one. In this case, i is going to be then zero, one, two, and three. Now I don't usually use that because there's of, and we'll get there in a second, but let's go and change out this other one. So it does the same thing again, const I in array two in this case, and all the assertions are still passing. And then let's take a look down here. We've got J and we're going from zero to the result link. So I'm going to say const J in result. So I see people use I and J a lot when it comes to index variables like this. And now I don't do that. I tend to use much more descriptive names since everything's uglified anyway. It doesn't really matter how long your names are. You can use a descriptive name that actually makes sense to folks. If you're curious, I and J actually come from Fortran, probably Fortran four, where you could save yourself a punch card by using I, J and K and L because those were predefined to be integer indexes. So I don't know why we still use it nowadays, but lots of people do. So the next thing I want to look at is this let result up here. And again, this is another mistake that people make when it comes to JavaScript thinking that result, if you change it to const here is immutable. So what's immutable about result isn't the array contents. It's actually the reference to the array. You can't set that to a new array, but you can modify the contents of that array all you want. Is that a constant? That's debatable, but that's the way that both JavaScript and TypeScript work. All right, but let's push on. Let's modernize this a little bit more. So in this case, I'm going to use of instead of in. So I'm going to say item of array one, and then I can use item here. That makes that a little bit easier. And then I'm going to go change this one also to item of, and then I'm going to change that to item. 
but I'm going to leave this one as an index. And why? Well, because we're setting the value based on that index into that array. If we just had a reference to the item within that array, and then we set that reference, we'd actually just be setting our own copy of the reference and that wouldn't work. So we need to keep this one currently as a lookup like that. But that brings me back to the efficiency issue here. So this for loop in here is an ON loop. And that means that we're just gonna run through all the data once. And we got a similar sort of thing with this for loop, that's also ON, but we've got an ON loop within that, which means that you've got a loop within the loop based on N, which gives you ON squared efficiency. And I can actually honestly make an argument that this has an ON cubed efficiency because we're basically just doing a loop unroll here by going and doing two different for loops around the two different arrays that we have. All right, so I'm, the next thing I wanna look at is this whole construction in here. This is a lot of road to go to just find out if an item exists in that second array. And we've got some array functions for this. So I'm gonna comment this out. All right, so what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to find the item index of a matching item in that array. So I'm gonna say that we have an item index and we're gonna look at the result array and we're gonna do find index. We're not just gonna do find, we're gonna do find index. And find index takes a predicate and that's gonna give you each item. So I'm gonna do like search item. And I'm gonna say that if the search item with that key matches the current item that we're looking at, again with that key, then we found it. And so the contract of find index is that it will return negative one if it doesn't find anything, or it'll return a non-negative index, which could start at zero. So that's what we'll look at. So I'm gonna say if the item index is greater than or equal to zero, then I want to set the result at that item index to the new item. Otherwise, I'm just gonna push onto our results. Okay, good. Looks like our tests are passing, so we're getting exactly the same output, and that's awesome. And we get rid of a lot of code. So we're starting to get code that's fits on a single page, which is great. Okay. All right, so now I'm starting to see where you could potentially have this bug. So we treat these two arrays very differently. In this first array, we just assume that everything is unique. And then in this second array, this is where we actually do the checking. So if I were to go and just take all this code and pop it in there, then we would actually go and check to make sure that every item in array one is unique. And if we scroll down here, we can see that we actually have changed the behavior. So in this case, we can take a look at merged and we can see that now we've actually gotten just three values, which is exactly what we should have had in the first place. So we've actually changed the behavior to remove a bug. And this is actually where refactoring gets kind of interesting is you may have other code that depends on that bug. So sometimes a bug is not a bug, but in this case, I actually think this is a genuine bug. So I'm gonna go and change this back to three. But of course now our code has gotten a lot more verbose again, right? So we're doing basically two big loops and they all basically do the same thing. So I'm gonna introduce you to a method that you might not have heard of when it comes to arrays and that's flat. So I'm gonna open up a little space up here. And this is a great thing about workbooks is you can do this kind of fun stuff like that. So I'm gonna look at one, two, three, four like that and I'm gonna select it. And yeah, you get one, two, three, four, cool, right? But if I make this an array of arrays, right now I get an array that has two arrays within it, one that has one and two, and the other has three and four. But if I call the flat method on that, that actually takes this back down to a single array. It actually flattens the array so that it's got all the values and it kind of squashes arrays within arrays like that. So how can we use that to our advantage? So I'm gonna make a new value called arrays, and it's going to be an array of those arrays. It's gonna be array one and array two together. So that's got all our data in it, but it also has it as a nested set of arrays. So I'm gonna create another value called flattened arrays. I'm gonna take that arrays and I'm gonna say flat it. Now let's take a look at that. All right, cool. So now we've got all of those items and they're in the order that they came in, right? So in this case, one A is at the beginning and one C is at the end. So if we just went through our array in that order, we would get the same behavior. So if I take this flattened arrays and I change this from array one to that flattened arrays, now I can remove this second loop and we get the same output. Cool, right? So that's nice. And we can even make this smaller. I can just say, okay, this dot flat. 
So we can make our code even smaller still, and that's great. The assertions still pass and everything works. Cool. But we're still doing an on squared lookup here, right? So for every single item coming in, we look at all of the stuff that we've done already. And in this case, is that really necessary? Because ID is a primary key. And for that, you could use a lookup. So I'm gonna go and create a new value called lookup and make it an object. And now I'm gonna say lookup of item at that key is the item. And now let's take a look at, and so let's take a look at lookup in this case. So lookup starts off as just an empty object and then it gets one and then one and two and then one, two and three, and there you go. So the key in this case is that ID and then the value is the object. So all we need to do is just say that we want those values. So if I say object dot values and then we give it that lookup. All right, so now we can get rid of that result. And the big win here is that this is now taken from an on squared efficiency function to an on efficiency function because this lookup here is 01, meaning that I just go and set that value and, and that's it. So super easy. But we can make this more idiomatic ES6 by using a reduce function. So I'm going to refactor this some more. I'm going to start with this array flat and I'm going to comment that out. And I'm going to say that we want to return the array flattened. And then we're going to take all those items and we're going to reduce them. So what does reduce take? Well, it takes two parameters. It takes a function, which takes an accumulator and an item. And it returns something. In this case, it's going to return an object. And then it takes an initial value, which in this case is going to be our lookup object. So the output of this reduce is going to be this lookup. Now, every time this function gets called, that accumulator is going to have the current value. So in this case, it's going to be called five times. And it's just going to take that same object over and over and over again, because it's going to take an object and return an object. So first thing we want to do is take everything that we have now, but we want to say that we want the key of this lookup to be set to the key of the item with the value as the item. So in that case, what we do is use square brackets like this. And then we say item at that key. So that's the key. And then the value is item. So let's take a look at our accumulator here. And we can see that it starts off as an empty object. And then we get one. We get one and two, and just like before, we created that lookup. Awesome. Now, the last thing we need to do is wrap it in object values, and that's going to pull out just those values. Let's take a look, and our tests still pass. Pretty sweet. Okay. Let's get rid of that. And now we're starting to get down to something that is really starting to look like idiomatic ES6 JavaScript to me. And then to get there, instead of using function, I'm going to use a const. I'm going to say merge array equals, and then that's going to be defined by, and we'll just give it this whole structure in here. Awesome. Very cool. And again, everything's still passing. Our bug is fixed. That's great. So how do we make this safe from a TypeScript perspective? Well, first off, what does that even mean? Well, in this case, what that means is probably that the array one and array two should be arrays of the same type, and those types should be an object. And this key over here should be one of the keys within that object. So let's try this out. So I'm going to say data type. And that's going to be our generic type. And I'm going to say that array one is an array of that data type. And array two is an array of that data type. So now that ensures that this data type has to match between array one and array two. And then in terms of constraining that key, what I can say is that key must be a key of that data type. So the only trick in here from a TypeScript perspective is that this key has to be either a string or a number. And yes, we've defined that this key has to be a key from this data type, but we haven't said that that key has to be a, a string or a number. So what I'm going to do in this case is just set that to any, and that's going to get rid of that issue. But how does this help us? So here's a cool thing for you. If I hit command space, it gives me hinting and it says, okay, the key in this case has to be either ID or name because that's the keys that are in these objects. So if I added, for example, in here, uh, last and said foo, and I went down here and I hit command space again, I would see now ID name and last. So again, I can just pick ID and that's good for that. But let's say that we want to enforce that these objects have to have ID and name. Well, for that, we can basically override the generic. So I'm going to put in the generic syntax here and then say that we have an object and that has an ID, which is a number. 
and name, which is a string. And now it's giving you a warning that, hey, you put in some extra stuff in here and it's not appropriate, so you can get rid of that. I gotta say the signature of this function wasn't even good to start with. Honestly, for me, I would put the key first and then any number of arrays at the end. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna move this key up to be the first parameter. And then I'll fix this code down here so that ID is the first item. And now what this allows us to do is actually use the ellipsis. So I can say, I want everything else to be arrays. And the only thing I need to do here is say that this is an array of arrays. So all of the items after this are going to be in this arrays. And then I can go down here and just remove array one, array two, put in arrays. And there you go. So now you can go and put in any number of arrays after the key and it'll flatten those. Could be one, could be 50, totally up to you. All right, and then one last thing before we go, I see that we've got some issues down here when it comes to typing. The output of the function is now an unknown. So I'm gonna go set the output of this function to be an array of that data type. And now we can see that we've got proper typing all the way through. Awesome. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this refactoring of GitHub Copilot code. I know I'm a fan of GitHub Copilot. I use it all the time. But the really important thing to understand about GitHub Copilot is that it's not always going to write the best code for you or that the code is going to be bug free. So make sure that you understand the code and make sure that you can maintain that code in production. All right, well, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to put those in the comment section down below. And if you have any suggestions for me on some GitHub Copilot code that you've seen and you want to see refactor, be sure to put that in a gist link down below or DM it to me. All right, in the meantime, of course, hit that like button if you like this video, hit the subscribe button if you really like the video, and of course, ring that bell if you want to be notified when a new blue collar coder comes out.